I think about design and if I think about the people I admire, people like Saul Bass and George Nelson, Charles Eames, are today's design thinkers, you know, do they have anything um, on these guys when it comes to thinking? Um, I don't think so. And in asking myself about, about this, I, I, I came up with, you know, they're probably better thinkers because they were makers. That's a little bit the difference between it being a um, food critic and a chef. Um, so people ask me all the time, you know, how do we innovate in so many different uh, fields, on so many different types of projects? Um, how do we work with companies? Um, you know, how do we do graphics and packaging and communications? Um, so I'll share a few principles today, um, and there's seven of them. Uh, today about um, about what I think is essential to the outcomes uh, at uh, at Fuse Project um, and and what is really fundamental these I think these elements are really fundamental about our work. Um, the first one is to start with questions, um, not answers. So many briefs that that you receive um, have all the answers already contained in the brief, um, and what we look for is. Um, briefs that have questions um, and no answers there. Um, and, you know, one of the best briefs that came to us essentially was a brief about a problem, which wasn't a problem, about the Puma shoebox. Um, and the Puma shoebox is a very visible product. It's branded in all the shoe stores. It's red. It's um, very cool. And um, there's no problem with it. It's the best shoebox out there. Um, but the question was, well, can we do something different there? Could we actually take a chance, innovate in a place where nobody really has done anything? You know, shoebox is a shoebox is a shoebox. And innovate in a place where, you know, German logistics engineers have really refined something um, over the years that they're perfectly happy with. So how are we going to convince them to do something different. Um, so, you know, this project started by visits all around the world, uh, manufacturing plants, watching people all around the world, and going on to these uh, distribution centers, logistics centers. Um, this is incredible. This, this machine, this robot that we're on here can, can go through this giant warehouse. I mean, this looks like a, I don't know, like a futuristic movie. Um, uh, like sci-fi, and then pick any box, uh, recognize it, and pick it, and bring it back down. Um, so observe, you know, these kind of observations led us to a solution which, in the end, was not a shoebox. You know, we try to reduce the amount of this, reduce the amount of that, and in the end, um, what we got is essentially the same thing that was there before from a brand standpoint. It's that big red thing, everybody recognizes it, but now it's a bag instead. And the amount of cardboard that's used is 65% less card uh, materials for the whole thing and less energy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is just a, a bit of a structural uh, piece that just slips into this bag. Um, the story there, though, is that and the, these principles were implemented to other parts of the project, uh, things like that seem completely impossible. Every piece of garment coming out of China or Vietnam, it comes out in a plastic bag which you can see on your left here. You know, every single piece of garment comes out in a plastic bag. That's by law, and we couldn't change it. And for weeks and weeks, we kind of racked our heads until somebody said, hey, let's fold the t-shirt one more time. <laughs> so that's half the bag it used to be. Um, and then we, ch we switched the materials to, um, to PLAs and others. Um, but the, the, the importance in this shoebox is that um, it, it's not like it's delivering less. You know, so much um, of you know, green design or sustainable design is out there and just tells you as a consumer that you, you're going to pay more, uh, but it, it's going to make you feel good. Um, the experience is going to have to be very different or less good or less practical, but you're going to feel good. This doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So um, on the other hand, 
Um, we wanted to deliver more with this, so it's a recycled PET bag. You, you throw your shoes in there at purchase. You don't need a big plastic bag coming out of the Puma um, retail. And it's a process of, of experience that includes the retail stuff. You know, they have to go downstairs in the stock room and have to come back with like eight boxes, you know, balancing on their arms. Now they just grab, you know, eight pairs of shoes by the handles and come up. Um, and then it, it has a second life. People reuse it for all kinds of stuff, which, you know, is suggested at retail, but actually happens in real life. Um, and there's a whole collection online of all the things that people do with, um, with a bag. So it actually delivers more and creates a level of participation and engagement. Um, and this is all for something that you don't pay for, by the way. It's free to you, it's a cost to the company, um, and, um, and it furthers, I think one of the most important you know, uh, elements of design for me is that it furthers an idea, um, an idea which is a 21st century idea, um, which is that sustainability can be practical and fun um, and, and have all, all the attributes of other things that we consume. Um, and in some way, for me, good design is essentially the reason to do good design and the reason to push for this is in some way, good design accelerates the adoption of new ideas, accelerate the adoption of the idea that, yes, sustainability is possible at a lower cost and um, with a better experience. And that's why I do this kind of work. But here's another, <clears throat> and that was a theory until we were able to, to sort of prove it. But one of the most important um, uh, principles at Fuse Project is that if you, you know, if you want to prove that an idea has a merit, uh, don't write a book about it. Go out and test it. Um, so we have this, this practice of testing everything, and you'll see a lot of that. Um, in, the, um, in the presentation. For example, um, we started on another, on another project which, which was initiated in this case by, um, by Herman Miller. And um, that project is about looking at a chair, but looking at it uh, dematerialized, looking at it um, at a lower price point. So delivering the same things you expect out of a high-end task chair, uh, but doing it in a way that is, um, um, that is at a much lower cost. Um, and so one of our theories was like, well, let's remove stuff, let's remove materials. And one of our theories was like, let's take a look at things like bridge construction and see whether that can be turned into a chair. These are some of the early sketches. Some of the principles we wanted to apply uh, up there are quotes from Charles Eames, the best to the most for the least, um, the best materials, ergonomics, design, to the most people for the least amount of money. So we went out and started to prove an experiment with, um, with this idea. And it doesn't start on the computer, as a lot of people think, it starts uh, I wanted to show you the rest here, sorry. Um, it starts with lots of sketches, lots of experimentation, lots of uh, hand drawings. These are all one-to-one -one large scale hand drawings. Um, it starts with uh, prototypes, a lot of failures, a lot of experiments, a lot of back and forth, a lot of study, uh, ergo studies and material studies. Um, Lots of quick mock-ups made out of paper, lots of mock-ups made out of foam, lots of mock-ups made out of plastic. Um, it almost sort of makes me dizzy to sort of look at the amount of work, which this is a very, very, very small cross-section of the things you need to, to, to make in order to make the whole thing work. Um, and every one of these components had to be optimized. You know, most chairs are really made out of a set of existing components. You just buy arms here and, you know, um, legs over there and, uh, um, um, and you sort of combine these, but it's never optimized. So what we were trying to do is to optimize every part so it would be the lightest uh, and the most efficient possible. Um, which meant building prototypes like this, proving out that a tower and 
materials strung across that tower would work, such as strings of plastics or wires or sheets of materials. Um, and every single one of them, they're pretty ugly. But every single one of them was such a level of excitement and satisfaction uh, in the studio. We built about 35 of these in our own studio. We built another 40 to 50 uh, at, at the uh, Herman Miller plant. And um, a lot of it ends up here. And a lot of it continues um, to be drawn and refined in detail, such as the pattern of the back, which had to be an exercise in density and and, um, and, and, and pattern and uh, tensions that, uh, how, do, how are the tensions distributed between these different points of attachments, um, as well as obviously different materials, different cuts, taking it, stretching it, <coughs> breaking it. Um, to a point where you know you're working with factories and um, and um, and um, with scientists as well on this. Uh, one of the theories that we had was is this notion of eco dematerialization, um, and it's it's a really simple one, which is if we take if we take mass and we remove as much as possible, make it as light as possible, uh, hollow it out. This is just an example of the, of the little back tensioner. Um, you can see the sort of evolution of it. Um, and, and you end up with 50, 60% of materials less. That's a heavy design exercise. That's costly. You make a new tool. But in the end, what you're left with here is less materials than over there. So lower carbon footprint, but also less cost. Because on, a, on, on any product, you pay for materials. So, uh, bringing together this notion of lower cost, attainability, and low carbon footprint um, is something that we pursue now aggressively on everything because we're out to prove a 21st century idea, which is things that are lighter, eco, or sustainable, et cetera, et cetera, um, should co cost less if they were designed from the ground up. So every part is thought out in this way. Things are exposed, structures are exposed, um, hollowed out, um, and the result is a product which is 35% lighter than any, anything else in the category and about half the price from other products in its category. So it's been, you know, that, that's been a three and a half year process and, and um, we're continuously working on this, but it's out there now. Um, one of the other principles is that like, you need to be there all the way. And what that means exactly, you have to be there when things are manufactured. In this deck, you'll see a lot of pictures of factories and what happens in factories. Um, which is, this is pretty amazing. This is the manufacturing of the back. The largest, most complex, mo mo most expensive tool that Herman Miller has ever made. You can see it come out over there. Um, to all the way at the other end of the spectrum, which is extending, stretching that story, those ideas, those principles you've, you went out and proved physically um, into a world where you communicate with dealers, with the public, et cetera, et cetera. So um, at Fuse Project, we do all these things. We're in love with the process. We're in love with the way we get there. And we do believe that the consumer is interested in that and has actually um, um, benefits from that and has a real interest in you being transparent about, about how you got there. And um, so everywhere we go, we share, I don't know, sketches and drawings. This is a side chair there. Um, we made these little structures. These are shipped all around the world. We've probably done dozens of small launches that different people all around the world from Asia to Europe to the US and they use you know, some of the very early prototypes there in a, in a final chair, but you know, real drawings, real, real uh, mock-ups, um, all the way to the sort of big, big shows that release a product, but still showing the process all the way through. And you, you can only do this with great teams. So I wanted to throw that in there. This is the industrial design team on the project, but there's also packaging and graphics and communications, obviously. Um, the picture is a little dark, but they look very, very glamorous there. This was, this was, this was launch night. 
Um, and our teams are incredibly diverse. Chen, who is our lead designer, is from China. Um, Naoya is um, from Japan. Um, Noah is from here. <laughs> and Brett as well. Um, and you remember this diagram, some of the early ideas around taking materials away, unframing, because chairs are always framed in hard enclosures. Really what we got with this, with this material, with this chair, is, um, is, is for the first time, the first unframed suspension back ever built. That's, that's part of how we took cost out. Um, well, some of these ideas became the advertising, which actually we did as well. Very few people know we do this kind of work. They always see a product and the name of the company and they think, oh, they do the product. But um, this was a, a nice way to continue the story. So the next, the next element, which I don't think I could be doing any of this work if it wasn't for about seven years ago, uh, my business partner and I um, decided to reinvent the business model. So we're supposed to be hyper creative, right? We're like, we're people who will come up with all kinds of solutions, we'll show the future to our clients, we do all this. And yet, our business models are the most boring that you, you, that, 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 and uncreative that you could ever think of. I mean, you know, a 16-year-old intern could run most of our businesses the way they run. You know, it's like hours, time spent on it, okay, a bunch of people managing, a bunch of creative people running around. Um, that's hard, that's hard. But the business portion, you know, how do you write a contract, how do you get, um, how do you, you know, uh, agree to do a project, is really uh, child's play. And most importantly, not creative. Which we decided, let's be creative with a business model. Um, which means that um, we become partners with our clients. More than 50% of our work is done um, in, in true partnership. With Jabon, this is the CEO of Jabon, it's just a funny picture, um, of him and I going to a factory and we're get, actually getting uh, scanned and checked. Uh, we, even as the owners, him as the owner of the company, can't go in there and take a product or take a, a piece of our own production out of there. But, um, 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 and this is Brett and I in, uh, in uh, paint booths. You have to spend a lot of time in paint booths if you want your colors to ever come out right. Um, and it, somehow it has to happen in Asia every single, on every single project. But in order to, for clients to say, yes, go in the paint booth, it needs to be right. Or, um, yes, you know, let's extend the story from you know, the industrial design to the packaging to the communications. You need to be in a partnership because if not, um, you need to, you know, they need to hire you for years and that costs way too much money. So all of, you know, 50% of our contracts have partnership return investments built into it, which means that we can do what we love to do as designers, which is stay on the project. You know, most business managers of design agencies, all they want to do is get you off the project as quickly as possible. But we, as designers, as everybody here knows, you want to stay on the project. And being a partner, being a stakeholder, meaning, means that you can't be a short-term hire, right? So we stay on. And we do things, you know, we launch a jam box, but we also do things like the VIP packaging, which is fun, or um, the advertising, the communications. And then we extend it even further, you know, to things like, uh, creating, you know, the product exhibits that are col that are cultural ambassadors for the brand and the product. Here we use 1,600 jam boxes and created these giant speakers um, in Milan in this sort of beautiful settings. These all these blocks and what happens is things like that. Your beautiful clean exhibit gets overrun with people, but that's what we want. Um, and also you find moments of calm and um, beauty um, um, early in the morning when nobody's there. <clears throat> the, another company with whom we've changed the business that we've become partners with is this awesome small underwear company called Pact, which is actually developing really, really nicely. And it's based on two principles, sustainability, everything's done within 100 miles radius. Um, all the packaging, for example, here is compostable. 
but you probably know about this already. But everything that we do, every collection that we do is in conjunction with a cause. So every two months we have a new cause partner and we do a collection. And we've done things from, you know, with Nobel Peace Prize winners, we've done things with Oceana, um, we've done things with um, um, all kinds of really incredible um, nonprofits. Here, for example, we have creative growth, and it's actually uh, artists with developmental issues that, that have designed the underwear. And then recently, we did something with the Sierra Club, uh, largest, largest group, uh, lar largest environmental uh, nonprofit in the United States, uh, largest memberships, very, very, you know, very much from the ground up. And so this is a, the anti-coal campaign that they've taken on. And what we figured during the process is that there's hundreds of college, colleges and universities that actually have cold firing plants on campus that use, either use energy derived from it or have it on campus. So then this happened, and this is just happening right now. Uh, dozens and dozens of campuses have students that are uh, demonstrating and taking their pants off <laughs> with our underwear on. Um, and, um, and uh, changing, actually there's also already 16 of these colleges that are changing their policies towards coal and are moving um, their uh, purchasing of energy uh, other places. So when we're able to, to be so involved, to be partners in these companies, we can create what I call truly 21st century types of businesses, truly 21st century types of companies. So my last uh, chapter is this notion of participation. And participation is something that takes place on every project that we work on, um, but I'll, I'll talk about two. The $100 laptop, which a lot of you are familiar with, I did learn a lot about how the, project, the program became successful in places where uh, the children owned the laptops, brought them home, but also where the teachers and the, the governments and the um, uh, were sort of deeply involved uh, with the program and actually owned them outright. Um, this is Peru, where 860,000 children have a laptop. Next door in Uruguay, every single child between, between the age of 6 and 18 that goes to public school has a laptop. So this notion, you know, and they fully own them. They, they do, you know, imagine 860,000, you know, computers doing an upgrade. Right? I mean, if you had, if you, you know, if you needed like a service company to do this for you, you can imagine the cost and the burden. Here, um, it was 14,000 volunteers that, you know, made the upgrade happen um, over a rel relative short period of time um, in Peru. So this notion of participation is one that we were able to apply in a recent project called See Better to Learn Better. These are eyeglasses that are donated, that are given for free in Mexico to 200 to 300,000 kids this year um, that don't have access to eye care and don't have eyeglasses. So they can't learn if they can't see. And this project happened, so this is like part of, I mean for me, I'm, I'm entirely part of the creative process. Somebody wants you to do this project, you're like, great, let's design some really nice glasses. That works, but to make, to make it truly work, um, the other 99% of that brilliant idea is, you know, how do we make it happen? So partnering with an incredible factory in Mexico that makes um, some of the best lenses in the world and coming up with a system of different parts that are uh, modular and utilizing their current system, which is if, you have, if you're making lenses, you're basically running a giant customization uh, logistics system you know, in your factory because every lens, right, left, is different for every one of your customers, in this case, the kids. So on top of that, we added the additional element of logistics for the frames. And that meant that um, the product would go through the factory, the lenses and the frames at the same time, being so, so that they could be individualized. Here you see them manufacturing parts, lots of little parts, lots and lots of little parts. But it's part of what they do. And then the result is a variety of different glasses, a variety of different colors and shapes, which the kids can find in a catalog and can even pick 
the bottom color and the top color on different sets of models and different sets of uh, eyeglasses. So this would have been a wonderful, great, fun idea which would have died on the very first review unless um, we had uh, you know, this partnership and this um, sort of this, this deep dive into, um, into the areas of, um, of, of manufacturing and, and partnering with this, uh, with this incredible company. And then they're happy kids. And then we also made the glasses unbreakable. We use a Swiss material called Grillamed, which is typically very, very expensive. But because the glasses have used such a small amount of quantity, it costs about 10 cents more um, to use this material in the eyeglasses, which made it um, completely worth it because of the longevity that it offers. Um, and um, the total cost for this, including the eye exam um, to the children in Mexico, uh, to the nonprofit, is uh, $10. Frames, lenses, custom lenses, and everything is five. So when you do these kind of projects for nonprofits, you also discover, hmm, there may be a business plan, a for-profit business plan there too. And uh, we're working on that as well. <clears throat> um, so I was trying to, yesterday over dinner, and we were, you know, we were talking about, about today, I was trying to find a sort of a summary of something that wouldn't be design thinking. And maybe it's holistic making. Um, maybe it's the kind of philosophy in the 21st century that, uh, that gets us to integrate all these different notions in order to do our work um, um, in, a, in, a, in a way that is right for the times that we live in. Um, I, I'm just going to finish with this. I watch Why, Why Men Create. It's a 1968 movie by Saul Bass. I don't know if anybody's seen it. But in there, um, there's a, a set of nice sentences. He says, where do ideas come from? From looking at one thing and seeing another. From fooling around and playing with possibilities, speculating, changing, pushing, pulling, transforming. And if you're lucky, you come up with something maybe worth saving, using, and building on. That's when the game stops, and that's when the work begins. Thank you. Thank you.